Today I'm going to show you how to run a one-way between subjects ANOVA using SPSS. I'm also going to give you an example that goes through um, the type of research question that can be answered through this sort of analysis. Um, and I'm going to also show you how to interpret the output from SPSS. So let's start with our research question. So our research question is, a researcher wants to know whether people who study in advance, study at the last minute, or don't study at all, differ in their amount of caffeine consumption. And so to test this, she asked students whether they typically, and then they were able to choose one of these three options. So they either could say that they typically study in advance, they could say that they typically study at the last minute, or they could say that they don't study at all. And then in addition to that, she also asked them to report their average number of caffeinated beverages that they consumed each week. So the reason we would use a one-way between subjects ANOVA to answer this question is first, the one way that refers to how many factors you have. In this example, we are just looking at the effect of one factor, in this case, it would be a quasi-independent variable. So the quasi-independent variable is whether students are studying in advance at the last minute or not studying at all. So that is our quasi-independent variable, which is a fact, our factor, our one factor, um, is whether students are studying in advance or not. And then we're looking at the effects of that um, factor on our dependent variable, which in this case would be the number of caffeinated beverages consumed per week, which is measured in a numeric scale. So um, people are answering with the number of caffeinated beverages that they're consuming each week. The other thing to note is that we wouldn't be able to do a t-test to answer this question because we are actually comparing three different groups to each other or three levels on our factor. So our factor of whether people are studying in, in advance or not has those three levels, which are studying in advance, studying at the last minute, and then not studying at all. So since there are three different groups that we're comparing, we would have to do an ANOVA. Also, another important thing to note is that this is a between subjects research design, which means that we have completely different people in each of these three groups. So participants had to select one of those three groups in which they were a part of. So students were either saying that they studied in advance or that they studied at the last minute or they didn't study at all. So they were in one of those three groups. So we also know that that variable is a quasi independent variable because people are, the participants are choosing which of those groups that they're in. So in order to make something, or in order for something to be a true independent variable, the researcher has to randomly choose what group people are in. So the researcher would have to tell the students to study in advance or study at the last minute or not study at all. So since the participants themselves are choosing which of those three groups they're in, that's what makes it a quasi-independent variable. So remember that we'll handle the analysis the same way, regardless of whether it's a true independent variable or a quasi-independent variable, but we do need to make sure our conclusion does not imply anything about causality since this is a quasi-independent variable. So let's go through how to do this analysis using SPSS. So I went ahead and opened up my, my data file that has the actual sample data collected in it. So in order to do our one way between subjects ANOVA, I'm going to start up here at the Analyze drop-down menu. So when we click on the Analyze drop-down menu, from there what we want to do is select the option to compare means. So in an ANOVA, what we're doing is we're comparing the means of our different groups to each other. So in this case, we're comparing the mean or the average number of caffeinated beverages consumed by the three groups that we wanted to compare. So the, the groups being the people who study in advance versus study at the last minute 
versus not studying at all. So to do that, we'll go ahead and move over here to this option that says One Way ANOVA, and we'll click on that. And here, when we're setting up our One Way ANOVA, I like to start with the factor first um, because it makes more logical sense to me because this is the one that is designating what group people are in. So again, the variable that we want to group people by in this example is whether they're studying in advance, studying at the last minute, or not studying at all. So I'm going to go ahead and find that variable located within my data file. If you ever want to switch the view of how your variables are presented here, maybe it's too hard to look at these variable labels, you can always right click here and then select display variable names. Makes it a little bit easier to find your variables sometimes. So I'm going to go ahead and look for that variable that I, I have in my data file that represents which group people are in. So whether they're studying in advance, studying at the last minute, or not studying at all. That is my variable and I'm moving that into the factor box. And then I'm gonna go ahead and find my dependent variable. In this example, we are looking to compare these groups on how much caffeine they're consuming. So we'll find that dependent variable and move that over into the dependent list. From here, we're actually gonna select a few options. So we'll click on this options button and you can really select any of these options that you want. The ones that I usually select are at least these first three options um, that give you some descriptive statistics, um, and it will also give you some of the effect sizes and testing that homogeneity of the variances assumption. So I like to select those three and then click continue. So it's not going to hurt anything to ask for more options if you want them. Um, Another thing that we want to make sure to do is to select a post hoc test. So even though we know that you only do a post hoc test if you did make the decision to reject the null hypothesis, um, the program will still just calculate it either way. So we actually, even though the post hoc test should be done after you make your initial decision about your ANOVA, we will ask the program to give us the output for the post hoc test regardless. So in that post hoc button, um, usually the ones I choose are Tukey and the Chefe test. It's really up to you whichever um, post hoc test you prefer to use. Um, I, I like to use these two because they're some of the more common ones, um, but any of the post hoc tests that you prefer will work. So just go ahead and click continue from here. Um, you can ask for as many post hoc tests as you want, but you should only use one when you're actually interpreting your analysis. So from here, we're going to go ahead and click on that OK button. And from after that, we'll get our output. So this is what our output looks like when we run our one way between subjects ANOVA. You'll see that it gives us a lot of different tables. Not all of these are necessary um, in terms of interpreting your analysis. So this first box we are going to use because this is the descriptive statistics that we asked for. So this tells us how many people were in each of our groups. It also tells us the mean of each of those groups. So this is a table that I'm definitely going to want to keep. And Let's focus here on the ANOVA table. It's also going to be a really important table for us to use. And we will talk about how to interpret that in a second. But another table that we definitely want to use is going to be this post hoc test table. So that's going to be a really important table if we need it. Um, the rest of these tables, you probably aren't going to use much. Um, unless you are interpreting the homogeneity of the variance assumption. Uh, but I'm going to focus more on these three tables, the descriptive statistics, the ANOVA table, and the post hoc table. I'm going to focus primarily on those um, for showing you how to look at your output from the ANOVA. So I'm going to copy and paste those into a PowerPoint just to make it easier to look at. 
So the first table in the output that I want to focus on is the table that's labeled ANOVA. So this is going to be our um, F ratio statistic that was calculated related to our actual ANOVA test. Um, so whenever we're looking at output from SPSS, we actually can just use this SIG column which, if you remember from previous videos, it just represents our p-value. So we can just use that sig column, aka our p-value, and just compare that to whatever our alpha level was in order to make our decision. So it's a, a really easy way to figure out whether um, your uh, null hypothesis should be rejected, meaning there is a significant difference, or whether you failed to reject your null hypothesis. All we do is just compare the SIG value or the p-value to our alpha level. In this example, we are using an alpha level of 0.05. Since that SIG value that we obtained of 0.02 is less than our alpha level, we would make that decision then to go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. So since our SIG or p is less than our alpha level, we reject the null hypothesis which means that there is a significant difference. So had we found a SIG that was bigger than our alpha level of 0.05, we would have made that other decision to fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that there is not a significant difference. But here we did identify a significant difference. So that decision that we should make should be to reject the null hypothesis. So we primarily want to report our findings in a way that makes more sense than just rejecting the null hypothesis. So here's how we'll actually report this decision in an APA style write-up. So our conclusion, here's our APA style write-up of at least part of the results so far. So we would start by saying a one-way between subjects ANOVA, so that's the analysis we just ran, revealed that there is a significant difference between people who study in advance, study at the last minute, or don't study at all in their amount of ca caffeine consumption. Oops, typo there. Um, here you'll see that uh, we report our F statistic uh, is italicized. And then in parentheses here, we have our degrees of freedom between groups. I got that from the table up here and then comma and a space, and then our degrees of freedom within groups. So I got that from the table up here as well. And then we have a space on both sides of the equal sign, and we report what our actual calculated value for F was. You'll notice that that value differs slightly from what is in our table, and that's because I rounded it to two numbers after the decimal point. So that's why it's 4.0, not 3. 0.997 is APA style wants us to round to two numbers after the decimal. Something that also might look slightly different to you is that I just reported what my actual p-value was. So in APA style, um, it used to be the case that you would just write p is less than whatever your alpha level was, but now since we have the ease of using SPSS, we can actually just say what our actual p-value was. So if you did reject your null hypothesis, meaning you had a significant effect, then you would actually just report your, your actual value for p. And again, remember that the sig column, that is your p-value. So we're still rounding to two numbers after the decimal. So I'm going to report my actual value of p, which was 0 0.02 once it's rounded. Um, had you failed to reject the null hypothesis, you would still just use the ns right here instead of reporting your p-value. So again, you're just going to want to report that p-value if it is indeed less than what your alpha level was. You should never report a p-value of zero. So even if your sig column says 0 0.000, you would say p is less than 0 0.001 in that case. So the reason for that is because there's never going to be a situation in which you have a zero probability of an outcome. So even if it's really, really small, your probability is still not going to be zero. So that's why we wouldn't say P is equal to zero.